Well, thanks for sticking around to the end of the session. Uh, to close things out, we're going to be discussing adolescent hip dysplasia and other causes of hip pain. Uh, again, my name is Will Morris, and we appreciate your attendance. We'll go through the definition of uh, adolescent dysplasia, some of the epidemiology, and see how that contrasts with infants, uh, the natural history and why we care about adolescent dysplasia, and then how we evaluate patients with adolescent hip pain and what our treatment is. Uh, throughout the talk, we'll also sprinkle in a little bit of information about hip impingement and slip capital femoral epiphysis and how you can tease apart some of those different diagnoses based on the physical exam. In infants, we know that uh, developmental dysplasia of the hip is pretty common and is associated with those four risk factors uh, listed on the bottom. And I know Dr. Kim just covered this topic beautifully. So instead, we're going to focus on these and other patients uh, once they reach skeletal maturity. Uh, adolescent dysplasia still follows the same principle that it concerns a hip uh, where the socket is shallow and doesn't adequately cover the femoral head, as you can see on the right side of the image. But interestingly, in contrast to infantile dysplasia, dysplasia at skeletal maturity is actually relatively more common. So we know that DDH in infants is about one in 100, uh, but in uh, patients at skeletal maturity, it's actually closer to three to 5%. Uh, there are a couple of nice Scandinavian uh, cross-sectional studies, which I have listed here, which looked at asymptomatic skeletally mature patients and found that their rate was about 3 to 5%. And these and other studies have borne out that female sex and a positive family history remain risk factors. Well, why do we care about dysplasia? Um, you know, most of those patients in the study were asymptomatic at that time. Um, and the reason for that is the association between hip dysplasia and the development of early osteoarthritis. And uh, one of my mentors from residency, Dan Cooperman, actually wrote a really neat paper where he put together and aggregated all of the evidence linking dysplasia with early osteoarthritis. And he broke it down into kind of three categories. There's the empirical studies uh, that link those two conditions, the biomechanical principles uh, that explain why we would see early degeneration of the hip, and then the absence of exceptions to the, rule, uh, to the evidence linking dysplasia and osteoarthritis. So let's start briefly diving into some of the empirical studies. I think this helps, helps under, uh, explain why we care so much about this concept. So a little over 80 years ago, Gunnar Weiberg first described dysplasia and objectively measured it using something called the centerage angle. And as you see on the bottom right, uh, this is an objective measurement of how well the socket covers the ball. And you can uh, obtain this angle by drawing a vertical line through the center of the femoral head, and then a line from the center of the femoral head out to the lateral border where the socket comes over the hip. So a larger angle reflects better hip coverage and a smaller angle reflects a more dysplastic hip. He initially tried to determine the normative data, the normative range for uh, the center edge angle. And he described it as over 20 degrees. For us, we actually consider it nowadays to be more like 25 and we'll come back to that. But importantly, his next step was he looked and found those patients that he deemed to have dysplasia. So they had a narrow center edge angle or narrow hip coverage of less than 20 degrees. And he followed those patients for up to 30 years. And what he found was that all of them went on to develop osteoarthritis. And the time it took to develop osteoarthritis was directly related uh, to the center edge angle. So the more dysplastic, the faster they developed arthritis. Subsequent uh, more recent studies have looked at this from a slightly different angle. So Khaleesi's group out of St. Louis looked at a little over 600 patients who had an early hip replacement before age 50. And that's what we worry about with dysplasia, that you'll get early degeneration early osteoarthritis and have a hip replacement at a young age. And what they found when we looked at all those patients is that about half of them had underlying hip dysplasia uh, thought to be the cause of their arthritis. Murphy's group uh, out of England similarly looked at a little over 100 patients who underwent hip dysplasia uh, for osteoarthritis uh, with underlying dysplasia. And uh, interestingly, they then looked at what happened to the other hip. So not the one that was replaced, but what was deemed to be the other healthy hip by age 65. And about two thirds of those patients went on to develop arthritis. And importantly, all of the ones that had significant dysplasia, so a center edge angle of 16 or less, uh, developed arthritis. We believe that this happens because of a couple of uh, biomechanical principles uh, that lead to early uh, degeneration of the joint. Without diving into the literature too much, we'll talk about the basic principle that pressure equals force over unit area. So on the left side of the image, you can see a well-covered femoral head with a broad surface area for that socket uh, outlined in green. 
Therefore, the forces of weight bearing that are distributed through the hip can be distributed across a broader surface area, which decreases the pressure on each kind of unit of cartilage. In contrast, on the right side of the image, you can see a shallow socket. And in the shallow socket, there's a narrower surface area to distribute all those forces. And so that increases the pressure on that cartilage, which we believe leads to earlier hip degeneration. Uh, we also think about the orientation of the socket, that in dysplasia, the socket's going to be a little more uh, obliquely oriented. Um, and so that instead of the normal compressive forces across the hip joint, like on the right side of the image, an obliquely oriented dysplastic socket leads to increased shear force that's trying to drive the ball out of the socket, putting shear stress across the cartilage and loading that lateral edge of the socket uh, with a, a ring of cartilage that, creates, uh, that, that sees a lot of stress called the labrum. The last part of the argument linking dysplasia and osteoarthritis is the absence of exceptions to this hypothesis. Not only is the theory intuitive based on those biomechanical principles and supported by empirical data, but there are no studies identifying healthy elderly hips with severe dysplasia. Or as Dr. Koopman put it, there's simply no case report of a card carrying Medicare patient who's arthritis free with a subluxated hip or severe dysplasia. So now that we know why we care about dysplasia, how do we help identify those patients who are coming into clinic with hip pain? Uh, so we'll go through some of the symptoms and how to uh, use the location to determine the underlying etiology. In general, this is gonna be a slightly older patient. So this is really an adolescent problem. Even with dysplasia, a seven-year-old or a nine-year-old is probably not gonna be having any hip pain, but uh, your middle school or a teenager um, is much more likely to have some pain due to dysplasia because they start seeing some stress on the cartilage. And when we think of intraarticular pain that's coming from the hip joint, that's usually anterior groin pain. And so if the patient is pointing anteriorly over their hip or they're localizing their pain, that can be intraarticular due to a cartilage injury, a labral tear, which remembers that ring of cartilage at the periphery of the socket, or potentially it could be uh, some inflammation of one of the big hip flexors called the iliopsoas tendon. Laterally, uh, pain can be coming from a variety of different sources. So if the patient is uh, localizing their tenderness over that bony prominence on the lateral aspect of the thigh. That's the greater trochanter, and it probably reflects trochanteric bursitis or inflammation of the bursa overlying that region. However, if the patient notices that their pain is a little further proximal, where the hip abductors are located, specifically gluteus medius, uh, they may be experiencing hip abductor fatigue. And this is really common with, uh, with hip dysplasia. Because that hip is biomechanically disadvantaged, at the end of a lot of activity, so your soccer player, maybe cross-country athlete, gymnast, they may have this lateral aching uh, uh, pain over their hip abductors um, because they get tired more easily because they're working harder to stabilize that shallow socket. Uh, alternatively, patients who have uh, tenderness over the bony prominences of the pelvis may have a different sort of uh, either acute injury or, or apophysitis or inflammation. So pain over the iliac crest where the abdominal musculature attaches uh, could reflect some inflammation of that apophysis, or the anterior superior iliac spine where the sartorius attaches, or the anterior inferior iliac spine where the rectus tendon attaches. Um, if they're complaining of acute pain, perhaps after a trauma or while you know, uh, running in track, there could be an avulsion of one of those apophyses, uh, versus if this is a more uh, chronic symptom, it could be something like uh, just some inflammation or apophysitis. Uh, you want to ask about aggravating factors. So patients who have anterior groin pain, for example, uh, while they're squatting or sitting in low chairs uh, may have some cartilage injury that they're aggravating. Uh, similarly, you might hear about mechanical symptoms like locking, popping, or catching, um, which can reflect intraarticular cartilage uh, tears that are, that are catching as the patient moves their hip. Popping can reflect snapping of the tendons, uh, either that iliopsoas tendon over the inside of the pelvis or some of the soft tissues laterally, like the iliotibial band snapping over the greater trochanter. So those mechanical symptoms are helpful for teasing apart different causes. Finally, anytime you're trying to understand uh, hip pain, it's always important to think about the spine. So I always ask about neurotype symptoms. Do they have a radiating pain that goes down their leg or perhaps paresthesias? And because that suggests that they're more likely to have a spinal pathology as opposed to an intraarticular or hip mechanical pathology. On exam, Again, I'll try and reproduce uh, their symptoms by palpating around their hip. And that can help you figure out, do they have tenderness palpation specifically over a bony prominence like the greater trochanter or one of their apophyses? Um, 
or do they have a, a tenderness specifically over the groin, suggesting maybe there's something more related to inflammation of the, uh, uh, the rectus tendon or perhaps uh, iliopsoas or intraarticular pain. Assessing range of motion is key, looking for contractures, limitations in range of motion. Specifically with internal rotation, if they're limited there, they may have hip impingement, a concept we'll look at briefly in the coming slides, or slipped capital femoral epiphysis. And we'll look at some specific uh, maneuvers that can help distinguish that. Uh, again, trying to distinguish between hip and spine pathology, you always wanna perform a straight leg raise, uh, which is done, as you can see on the right side of the slide, by flexing the hip up with the knee extended. If you reproduce their pain and it's radiating pain down their leg, uh, that would suggest this is more likely a spinal pathology, like a herniated disc, for example, as opposed to something coming from the hip. Uh, always assess the patient's strength, including their hip flexion and especially hip abductor strength, um, because we frequently see that they're a little bit deconditioned or weaker when they're coming in with pain, and that gives us a target for physical therapy. One sign that you can look for is the Trendelenburg sign. When you have the patient stand on one leg, as you can see in the image on the right, uh, bending their knee about 90 degrees like a flamingo. Uh, normally, the reason why we don't tip over, even though our center of body weight is, in this case, to the right of the left leg that we're standing on, uh, the reason why we don't tip away is because of those hip abductors like the gluteus medius that are pulling us back up over the top of our leg. In patients who have uh, a biomechanically disadvantaged dysplastic hip, or who are deconditioned, you'll see that pelvis drop away from the leg you're standing on. And it suggests that that left leg in this case has a weak hip abductor. Alternatively, the patient might cheat a little bit and lean over that affected side uh, in order to keep their center of mass over that uh, leg because those muscles are a little weaker. A couple of specific tests to further evaluate for dysplasia include the apprehension test. And this can be done a couple of different ways. By having the patient lay in the lateral position, uh, you can then abduct their leg 30 degrees away from midline, flex their knee 90 degrees, and then gradually bring them into extension. For the patient who has uh, relative anterior uncovering of the socket from dysplasia, you're bringing the ball right against that area and either reproduction of pain or a sensation of apprehension is a positive test and suggests there may be some instability or dysplasia. This can also be done uh, by having the patient scoot towards the edge of the table, uh, flex their well hip up, so you can see they're bringing their knee to their chest and then extending and externally rotating the affected leg off the end of the table. Again, anterior groin pain or a sensation of apprehension is a positive test. We can also look for hip impingement uh, by bringing the hip into 90 degrees of flexion, adducting it, meaning bringing it towards the midline and internally rotating it. What we're trying to reproduce here is hip impingement where we uh, see collision of the femoral head or neck against the socket. If this, uh, if this creates pain, there may be a cartilage injury such as a labral tear or other cartilage tear, and we're reproducing that pain by creating that collision of the ball against the socket. This can happen in normal hips or, or hips where there's abnormal shape to the ball and socket creating premature collision or even in dysplasia. Um, but if we see this, even in a patient with dysplasia, it's just there may be some intraarticular injury may predispose or, or point us towards getting advanced imaging like an MRI to evaluate those intraarticular soft tissues. I'd be remiss if I didn't briefly talk about slip capital femoral epiphysis. So we talked about limited internal rotation. And if a patient's coming in with hip pain, particularly if they're adolescent, obese, you need to look out for specific factors. If they're limping, walking with their foot externally rotated, or if they have limitations in internal rotation, uh, then you start thinking about a slipped capital femoral epiphysis. Specifically, if uh, they have obligate external rotation, that's nearly pathognomonic for this condition. So if you see as you flex the patient's hip up in the top image, normally we can maintain our, our hip with neutral alignment with the knee pointing straight up. However, with slipped capital femoral epiphysis, specifically there's some deformity of the proximal femur, then the patient won't be able to flex their hip straight up uh, and they'll have to turn their leg out into external rotation, as you see on the bottom image, in order to accommodate further flexion. So if you see that, you need to go ahead and get an AP pelvis film to look and make sure you don't miss the subcapital femoral epiphysis. Uh, our radiographic evaluation is important for truly diagnosing dysplasia. This is our workhorse uh, tool for evaluation of hip coverage, and it's the standing AP pelvis film. We get it standing so we can assess their hip coverage and their functional position. Uh, 
And again, we use the center edge angle, or in this case, the lateral center edge angle, which is the more common term uh, currently, where we draw a vertical line from the center of the femoral head and a line from the center of the femoral head out to the edge of the socket. A larger angle means greater femoral head coverage by the socket. And so we wanna see an angle greater than 25 degrees. Less than 25, we consider dysplasia. We can also look at the inclination of the socket by drawing a line between the medial and lateral edges of the socket, as you can see. The angle form between that and a horizontal line is the inclination. And the more inclined the, uh, the socket is, the more dysplastic. Our treatment for uh, dysplasia initially begins with physical therapy, non-operatively, um, specifically targeting those muscles that are either weaker or deconditioned, like the hip abductors, core strengthening, uh, along with the use of anti-inflammatories. And this is frequently very successful. It doesn't address the underlying uh, biomechanical problem, but in mild cases, this may cure the symptoms that the patient has. Um, however, we're still going to keep an eye on them to make sure their symptoms don't recur. Occasionally, we'll use a corticosteroid injection, which can have both diagnostic and therapeutic purposes. We talked about the really common presentation of that groin pain or that hip abductor fatigue pain, um, but if a patient has an atypical presentation and we're not sure if the pain is truly coming from their dysplasia, uh, or intraarticular pathology by, uh, by injecting corticosteroid with numbing medication. If we address their pain, we have diagnostic utility there. We know that the pain was coming from the hip joint and then uh, the therapeutic aspect from the corticosteroid of trying to turn that inflammation down. Not something we do in all cases, but a tool in our tool belt. Our surgical indications are for patients who fail non-operative management. Um, and so that's a patient that has radiographic dysplasia and pain Usually, again, that abductor fatigue pain just above the greater trochanter or intraarticular groin pain anteriorly. Uh, and we treat them uh, surgically with what's called a periacetab of the osteotomy, as we'll show you on the next page. For patients who have dysplasia without pain, that's a little more controversial. But in general, we're not going to treat somebody unless their hip is sliding out of their socket, um, unless they're having symptoms. So um, we would, however, caution you that if this is, for example, uh, um, an incidental finding on a pelvis film that you may be obtaining for other reasons, we'd still encourage you to uh, refer the patient over for evaluation because we want to talk with them, ensure they're asymptomatic, and also have the discussion because even asymptomatic uh, patients with dysplasia will keep an eye on periodically to make sure that when they do develop symptoms, which suggests there's cartilage and stress, we can address it uh, uh, quickly. So the surgical treatment is the periacetabular osteotomy in patients who are approaching skeletal maturity or already skeletal mature. This is a very specialized procedure that we perform here at Scottish Rite, uh, where you make a number of cuts around the socket of, uh, of the acetabulum without getting into the acetabulum or disrupting the pelvic ring itself, uh, as you can see on the left side. And then on the right side of the slide, you can see that we can then reorient the socket so that it provides better femoral head coverage. So it um, sits uh, over the top of the femoral head to better distribute those forces. This is an example of one of my patients that came in with uh, left groin pain and lateral abductor pain and had a center edge angle of 16. So based on those empirical studies, was at risk for developing early osteoarthritis. And so underwent a periacetabular osteotomy. And you can now see that the socket comes out further towards the edge of the ball. And now the center edge angle is, is uh, 33 degrees reflecting reflecting broader distribution of those forces across uh, the cartilage. And the patient's happy and gotten back to, uh, uh, gotten back to basketball. So uh, that's anecdotally what one patient that did well. However, we have great evidence of uh, success of this procedure long-term in terms of getting patients back to sport, a, a, a study which I don't have pulled up here, uh, as well as most importantly in preventing early hip replacement. And so you can see this study, which also includes much older patients in a pediatric population, uh, has great success long term in taking those symptomatic dysplastic hips and preventing them from going on to hip replacement over the long term. So in general, uh, or in summary, you know, dysplasia in adolescence, just like in infants, is still a shallow socket with an undercovered femoral head. But unlike in infants, it's actually a much more common problem. Uh, with three to 5% rates of, uh, of dysplasia in young adulthood, although most of those are asymptomatic. However, in the patient that's developing anterior groin pain or that lateral abductor pain, um, this may be a sign that they're having some symptomatic dysplasia and they're at risk of developing early osteoarthritis. The periacetabular osteotomy is very successful in preventing early hip replacement and making patients asymptomatic and getting them back to what they wanna do.
And so refer patients early so that we can evaluate them, discuss, even if they're asymptomatic, so that way we can have this discussion and make sure we can keep a close eye on them. Well, uh, thank you very much. We appreciate uh, your attention throughout the conference and we look forward to this last question and answer session.